Tonight on the News 4 Rundown, a deal to bring the Caps and Wizards to Virginia now appears to be on life support. That's a real disappointment, and I believe that is, as I said earlier, a monumental mistake for the Commonwealth. We have reaction from Richmond and where the deal could go next. Gone but never forgotten, an 18-year-old Marine was killed in a car crash back in 2018. Our Maryland mother is fighting to keep her son's memory alive years later. And an underground system that provides water to about 1 million people in D.C. is in dire need of repair. In a story you will only see on News 4, a closer look at the troubling cracks, plus what's being done to fix it. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us on the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Sean Yancey. And I'm Maria Renee Barijas. It's Thursday, March 7th, and we begin with the monumental roadblock to the monumental move. Today in Richmond, Virginia's governor called the state Senate's decision to table the planned arena district for the Caps and Wizards a monumental mistake. And members of the coalition to stop the arena at Potomac Yards praised the decision not to include funds for the sports and entertainment district in Alexandria's in Alexandria in Virginia's budget. The coalition is pleased that the General Assembly listened to the residents of Alexandria and citizens throughout the Commonwealth. In Richmond, Governor Glenn Youngkin stopped short of saying he'd try to make any maneuvers to get the bill passed. Instead, he said the ball is now in the Senate's court. Northern Virginia Bureau reporter Drew Wilder has been on the story from the beginning. He's in Richmond tonight with a look at what comes next. The arena deal is on life support and any chance at bringing it back to life gets smaller by the second. Now, Virginia's governor has a couple of options to try to get this deal done still, but they would all still require the support of the Virginia state senator who has taken pride in blocking this deal to this point. The thorn in his side watching over his shoulder. State Senate President Louise Lucas looking down on Governor Glenn Youngkin and taking stock of the political firestorm she just orchestrated. Youngkin is furious that his deal to bring the Washington Capitals and Wizards to Virginia is now on life support. And that's a real disappointment, and I believe that is, as I said earlier, a monumental mistake for the Commonwealth. Lucas has been against the deal from the start, but her Democratic colleagues weren't so quick to dismiss it. Delegate Luke Torian carried the arena deal through the House and wanted to see it move forward, but does not want to say directly why, rather who, prevented the deal from moving forward in the state budget package. I cannot explain to you why it's not there. Why, why Are you disappointed that it didn't get in front of people to have a debate, to talk about it? I cannot explain to you why it is not there. Youngkin knows why it's not there. There is a broad bipartisan group of House leadership and Senate leadership that want to move forward. Um, they're running into a, a single roadblock. The governor, though, also not using names when a reporter pressed him. Well, you know, Dave. Lucas standing proud of the budget she helped craft and stressing that she never supported this deal because taxpayers were the backstop if the financing failed. But it's more than dollars to an 80-year-old black woman who says she fought for years to earn her seat as the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Here you have Don Scott, who is the first African-American Speaker of the House. You've got Luke Torin, who's the chair of House Appropriations. You've got me over here as chair of Senate Finance and Appropriations. The last thing I would want to see while African-Americans have this level of leadership is for this thing to go south. Not on my watch. But now the governor can decide what Democratic priorities won't happen on his watch. Dems approved a minimum wage increase, teacher pay increases, and a bill to establish a recreational marijuana marketplace. Youngkin implying at least one of those Dem priorities is likely dead on arrival. I don't have any interest in the cannabis legislation. Senate Majority Leader Scott Suraville is disappointed the arena bill was killed without any debate, but now wonders if the governor's veto pen will strike back, potentially killing the cannabis bill. Baffling to me, given that it would generate 300 to 500 million dollars a year for the state. We have a seven billion dollar K through 12 hole, according to our independent auditor, and supported by 65 percent of the public. It just his opposition to it makes zero sense to me. With the arena deal out of the budget, Democrats have little leverage to achieve the priorities that their majority allowed them to pass this year. Here are the options still on the table for the governor to get this deal done. Number one, he could amend the budget and send it back to the General Assembly, but his staff tells me he doesn't intend to do that. He could write his own bill, a piece of standalone legislation to get the arena deal done, call a special session with the legislature and send that to him, but his staff tells me he doesn't want to do that either. What Youngkin wants to happen is he wants the state Senate to get the arena deal into the budget that they're supposed to have finished by 11.59 p.m. tonight. 
the majority leader of the state Senate says, while it might not be entirely impossible, it is incredibly improbable. Reporting in Richmond, Drew Wilder, News 4. And now to one of the top stories we're following tonight. Police arrested a man not far from the White House at 16th and 8th Streets near Lafayette Square. NBC News cameras recorded a man in a convertible get into a dispute with protesters and officers. You can see police take the man down. We're told a ceasefire now protest was underway. No one was hurt. We're still lurking, working to learn if the man will be charged. We'll continue to follow the story as it develops. And a teen accused of trying to shoot someone on a Prince George's County school bus will be tried as an adult. Police say Caden Holland, who was 15 at the time, allegedly attacked another student and tried to shoot him multiple times. The gun never went off. Montgomery County Police released a photo of the person they believe is behind a rash of break-ins. The latest crimes happened early this morning at a shopping center in Montgomery Village. Police say the person of interest could also be connected to other recent crimes. The founder of a D.C. nonprofit that serves homeless LGBTQ youth is set to appear in federal court Friday. Authorities arrested Casa Rubí founder Rubí Corrado in Laurel on federal charges of fraud and money laundering. Corrado is accused of transferring emergency relief funds intended for the nonprofit to private bank accounts and hiding it from the IRS. A Maryland mother who lost her son in a tragic car crash is now working to keep his memory alive. For years after the crash, she visited his roadside memorial. But recently, she learned the Maryland Department of Transportation removed it, along with countless other memorials along roadways. Consumer reporter Susan Hogan joins us with how this very persistent mother found a way to make sure no one would forget her son. This senseless crash. And I'd lost something that was close to me. When we first met Sandra Johnson Carter in 2018, it was just three months after her 18-year-old son, Mike, a Marine, died in a car crash on Maryland's eastern shore. His death involved a guardrail end piece that was the focus of a series of news for consumer investigations that exposed their potential dangers. Sandra, along with countless other families, fought for a nationwide recall of these particular guardrails. Although that didn't happen, several states, including Maryland and Virginia, have removed them. Why would you take down my son's road signs memorial? But this fall, Sandra faced a new fight when the Maryland State Highway Administration told her the plaque and other items left in honor of her son at his crash site had to be removed. His friends and myself, when we drive by and we, we dedicate our time there, put in flowers. She was told she had two weeks to gather the memorabilia that for years stood as a reminder of where her son Mike took his last breath. More than 600 people die on Maryland roads every single year. And according to the state, there's been an increase in roadside memorials similar to this one. But unfortunately, the very people who come to pay tribute to their loved ones become victims themselves. In 2018, a Baltimore man died after being struck by a car while visiting his friend's roadside memorial. In February of 2023, a vehicle struck and injured a man visiting his brother's memorial in Salisbury. While there's no law addressing Maryland roadside memorials specifically, there are state and federal laws that prohibit placement of anything along state roads, mostly out of safety concerns. Over the years, the State Highway Administration has been removing these memorials to prevent further tragedies, a decision Sandra understands. If someone of one of Mike's friends would have lost their lives while standing at that roadside memorial trying to honor him, I could never live with myself. The State Highway Administration told Sandra that there was something they could do so no one would forget Michael. Members of law enforcement, first responders and service members who die in the line of duty can be honored with roadway dedication signs. What we've all been waiting for. And on February 7th, on the sixth year anniversary of Mike's death, the state unveiled his sign at a ceremony in his honor. <laughs> this one will be placed along the southbound side of Route 13. There's another one just like it already installed on the northbound side. This is so beautiful. 
and we were there with Sandra as she saw it for the first time. Every time you go here, you see his name, Mike Mike. Mike Mike. For a mom who spent six years of her life making sure no one would forget him, this was a moment she will never forget. I'll be long gone, and generations will still be able to come by here and snow but their Uncle Mike. That's, that's the beauty of this, forever memorialized. Now, the Maryland State Highway Administration tells us that it is continuing to explore ideas that will serve as a solemn reminder of those who lost their lives along Maryland highways. One idea is a living memorial for victims by planting trees to represent the lives lost. Back to you. Thank you, Susan. Another great way to remember lives lost. Well, a song lyrics legislation triggered a debate in Annapolis. The question is whether lawyers should be allowed to use musical lyrics, performances, or creative expression against the artist in criminal prosecutions. A new bill before the Maryland General Assembly would limit the use of an artist's creative expression and ensure that expression is not admissible against a defendant unless the court finds clear and convincing evidence. The bill defines the expression as the act of creativity or imagination in production, which which includes sounds, words, movements, or symbols. I want to make sure and safeguard creative, creative expression here in the state of Maryland. Not everyone agrees with the plan. Baltimore County prosecutor released a statement that said in part, in today's world of prosecution of criminal cases, the use of social media is very prevalent. Detectives and prosecutors are constantly scanning these sites for evidence to support the identity of a criminal. Now, the state delegate who's co-sponsoring the bill said it still has to be voted out of committees in both the House and Senate before the General Assembly can vote on the bill. If it passes both chambers, it will then head to Governor Westmore to sign into law. And the underground system that provides a drinking water for D.C. and parts of Virginia is a dire in need of repair. The project will cost tens of millions of dollars and create some traffic issues along one major roadway over the next year. News 4's Mark Seagraves has an exclusive look at the aging conduit and what's being done to fix it. It's a story you'll only see on News 4. This is a look inside the underground conduit that carries our drinking water from Great Falls into the district, much of it directly beneath MacArthur Boulevard. What people don't realize is these wa this water pipe is in some cases only 12 inches under the surface of the road. So you are driving directly on top of this pipe that is uh, quite old and it's unreinforced and so it's very important that people obey the weight limits on the roadway. An inspection in 2022 revealed problems with the aging tunnel. There's only one section that was particularly alarming uh, where uh, the cracks were very significant and the, the conduit itself, which is normally circular, uh, had started to compress into an oval shape at which point that's imminently uh, in, in a state of structural failure. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers believes the culprits are drivers in big trucks, ignoring the weight restrictions from MacArthur Boulevard. One problem is navigation apps like Waze that direct drivers along MacArthur Boulevard regardless of their weight. That has been our one of our concerns, right? So Waze, uh, although it's very intelligent in some respects, it does not have that kind of information embedded in it, to, such as weight limits, and you can't type in, hey, I'm in a vehicle that weighs 30,000 pounds. Uh, so it will try to take you what it thinks is the best route. The work to repair the conduit, which was built in the 1860s, will take the rest of this year and will result in some above ground delays for drivers along MacArthur Boulevard, which will be down to one lane in some parts between Glenico and the DC line. The original intake here at Great Falls operates using gravity to move the water. While the conduit is offline for a year during repairs, the backup system at Little Falls will be used. That system relies on electricity, which costs about $10,000 a day to operate. Beneath the old conduit road, Mark Seagraves, News 4. And still to come tonight on the News 4 Rundown, a black-owned school food program is getting ready to bring fresh meals to D.C. schools. That's right. News 4's Malek Green is working for you in the community. She'll take a closer look at the effort and, and explain why it means more than just feeding students. Plus... I'm Ted Oberg with the I-Team at the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond, where Democrats control the House and the Senate. And this year, gun safety advocates were hoping to get a lot more on that issue across the governor's desk. We'll explain why they're not next. 
Well, gun safety laws have been sailing through the Democratic-controlled Virginia General Assembly, but the big question remains, which ones will Republican Governor, Governor Glenn Youngkin sign? He's expected to sign some, but as Ted Oberg and the News 4 I team found when they traveled to Richmond, some victims' advocates say it isn't enough. The News 4 I team was there when the ATF recently raised the alarm about Glock switches on the streets of D.C. It's a small device that turns a common handgun into an incredibly dangerous and lethal machine gun. Also known as auto sears, they're already banned federally. But former Loudoun County prosecutor, now state senator Russett Perry, led the charge in the state Senate to outlaw them in Virginia. It can be one of those things that gives states an extra tool to combat um, you know, dangerous gun violence. Yeah that everyone, the most people can get behind and agree on. It passed out of the state Senate with bipartisan support. And in the House, a nearly identical Glock switch ban, Delegate Mike Jones sponsored, has unanimous support, not a single no vote, even from a Republican. I'm proud of my Republican colleagues. Uh, everyone always talks about working across the aisle. This is one of those issues. Safe streets matter to everyone. It's one law even gun rights support. Sort of. I'm not going to lose any sleep if they sign that into law, right? Because it, it won't affect the law-abiding citizen. Yeah. It won't affect me. That bill is now on its way to the governor's desk for his signature, and it's expected to get it. But that may be where the agreement on this issue ends here in Richmond, and the politics of it take over at the governor's desk, because just signing something on gun safety isn't what advocates were hoping for this session. I'm sure he and his team will evaluate them and then he'll cherry pick which ones he might want to sign. Political observers expect the Virginia governor to sign the Glock switch bill along with a tax credit for gun locks, allowing a small price break on simple safety devices to lock guns up. Also, a modified safe storage law, which would make it a misdemeanor to leave a gun where kids could access the gun and use it in a crime. A person could face a felony charge only if they knew the child was a threat. It's not enough. It's just not enough. Corey Haas with the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health Center for Gun Violence Solutions works as a gun safety advocate at the Virginia State Capitol. But she says the issue for her is far more than a job. It is personal to me. 17 years ago next month, her daughter survived the Virginia Tech shooting where 32 of her daughter's fellow students did not. On average, three people will die today from firearms. What about those families? What is the governor doing to care for them? What is the governor doing to prevent that violence? She hopes the governor would sign a more robust safe storage bill, which is also passing through the House and Senate, and consider the assault weapons ban that Democrats pushed through this session. He's going to veto the bill. And, you know, that bill is something that the general public wants over and over and over again. To Kurt Sebastian, who trains law enforcement and civilians and advocates for training for all gun owners, the Virginia safe storage law is a non-start. Frankly, I like the idea of my 12-year-old uh, being able to defend herself even if I wasn't with her. And he says the assault weapons ban would be even worse, predicting political doom for Governor Yunkin should he sign it. I think, obviously, it, it would decimate him on yeah. the right. Which is not the progress Democrats who control the House and Senate for the first time since 2021, we're hoping for. What's the chance the governor's going to sign an assault weapons bill? I don't, I, he, he may not, but he's going to have to tell everyday Virginians, he's going to have to tell moms, dads, that we don't care about these streets, these guns being on the street, being next to your kids. When the I-team reached out to the governor, who has until Friday to make a decision, a spokesperson told us Virginia's gun laws are already among the toughest in the nation. And Governor Yunkin continues to pursue policies to hold criminals that commit crimes with guns accountable by strengthening penalties to effectively keep the criminals off the streets and Virginians safe. The spokesperson added the governor is reviewing the legislation that's already been delivered to his desk as he continues to watch how the General Assembly chooses to act on other important priorities. I'm Ted Oberg for the News 4 IT. Coming up in the scene, an exclusive new art exhibit. Done by me. I'm the artist at Splatter Paint in Manassas. We are just throwing paint at art, working through some stuff, and having a great time celebrating seven years of a creative venture in Prince William County. I'm Tommy McFly. It's all on the way on News 4.
And welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. You know, this week is National School Breakfast Week. It celebrates the importance of nutritious meals for students. It is so important. That's why one successful school food program is looking to bring its model to D.C.'s wards 7 and 8. News 4's Millette Green is working for the community with the details. Red Rabbit is one of the largest black-owned school food programs along the Mid-Atlantic. It's now ready to bring culturally relevant lunches to D.C. school cafeterias. Red Rabbit's food justice model will soon serve up what it calls culturally relevant healthy meals to kids in some school cafeterias in wards 7 and 8. It's a continuation of what the founder and CEO, Reese Powell, started in the South Bronx. Newark, New Jersey, and Southwest Philly. This was a culture story. This was a community story. And that I was just, and our business, Red Rabbit, was just a continuation of the social justice struggle, of the civil rights struggle to uplift communities of color. And so we realized that our, our role in that got a little bigger than just serving healthy food. We needed to serve uplifting food. Reese says when Red Rabbit enters a new city, they first work to become part of the community, which is a key ingredient to its success. We, we started to design the cafeterias to feel like neighborhood restaurants. So again, looking around the neighborhood, what is the culture of this neighborhood? Who are artists that are local to this neighborhood? Who are chefs that have written cookbooks that come from this neighborhood? Let's put those in the space so it looks and feels like a part of the community. And then when you combine that with the food and the menus that are that are you know consistent with the culture and reflective of the kids, you end up with an environment that's just joyful and celebratory. So we kind of see ourselves not just as a school food company, but more and more like a social justice company, a company of uplift and celebration for black and Latino communities. So next month, we'll know which D.C. schools Red Rabbit will select. The chefs will take over the kitchens and meals this fall, adding to the 150 schools and 40,000 students they serve. Thank you, Molette. What a wonderful program. Isn't it? It should be in a lot of communities and a lot of schools, right? I hope right? they can expand. Yep, yes, indeed. definitely. Well, listen, there's a lot of love and community care happening in Alexandra, Virginia. The group Women for Afghan Women and the group Islamic Relief USA are distributing food packages for families. Their mission this Ramadan is to ensure that refugees and Muslim migrants can celebrate the month and not have to worry about food. So we have uh, currently 135 food boxes that we're hoping to give out. Um, we're halfway through, so we're hoping that by the end of the day we'll be all done and hopefully be able to help our community. The groups told us the food boxes can support a family of four for the entire month of Ramadan, which begins Sunday at midnight. Well, painting with brushes is just one way to celebrate art. For seven years, the Prince William County studio has been encouraging budding artists to toss and splatter paint, all in the name of creativity and fun. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> and Tommy McFly has more, of course, in the scene. I don't know what else I want to add to this, but you gotta, you gotta step back sometimes and look at your art to make sure you see it from all perspectives. Uh, you know, from the beginning, I said it was stress relief meets creativity. At Manassas Mall, Splatter Paint Room is bringing the inner artist out. Suits, boots, goggles, and gloves. We got the pep talk. Oh yeah, I give you a little speech on the way in to get you fired up. And then, art in action. Think like swinging like a baseball bat or tennis racket, so nice, Ooh. firm, firm swings. <laughs> And then you. That's Andrew Cummins. He created Splatter Paint Room. When did you look at the art world and say, you know what we need more of? Throwing paint. Fun. We need more fun. Okay. That's more like it. And so I've been, uh, I've been a potter for 23 years. So we do pottery wheel lessons here as well. And uh, I just like services where everybody can feel creative. What's the most ridiculous technique you've seen? Oh, you know what? Teenage girls do the most ridiculous stuff. Like that, like 12 to 14 years old. Uh, how so? Rolling on the ground over their paintings. Oh, really? Oh, just, just ridiculous, silly stuff, yeah. According to Andrew, and the layers and layers of paint on the wall, more than 10,000 masterpieces have been created here. Look at that. When do you know when you're done? I don't know. When are you done? Am I done? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I started out with a swirl kind of situation, and now we're into, like, stacking the layers of paint on top of each other. Wow. So don't think too much. I'm not thinking. I haven't thought in a while. You just go. Perfect. 
in Manassas with the scene. Pizza box. Brilliant. Take it by paint home. Tommy McFly, <laughs> News 4. By the way, Tommy, I think you did a great job. Don't did you think it? I look yes. pretty good? He's an artist. You said you wanted to try that? I wanted to try it out, and but I'm afraid my kids will act like they said, that, you know, that's roll the, around the paint, but that, I guess that's, that's the part point. of it. That's yeah. the part of it. It's Be fun. Creative. Have a little fun out <laughs> yes, there. Yes, definitely. All right, well, finally tonight, a woman is making her story this Women's History Month. Sailor Cole Brower just became the first American woman to race solo, nonstop, and unassisted around the world. The 29 year old finished the global solo challenge on Wednesday after 130 days at sea. She set off from Spain back in October. Now she injured her ribs during the race when autopilot issues led to a brooch. She got thrown across the boat. Despite the injury, she made the repairs, continued sailing, came in second place and made history as the youngest skipper and the only woman sailor in the fleet of 16 boats. Congratulations to her. Impressive, yes. Well, that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Sean Yancey. And I'm Maria Renee Buddy. Just we'll see you back, of course, here tomorrow. Have a good night.